Praise the Lord. It's been very good to be together in the Word. So this morning we come to the uh, final session. And um, what is the subject of this week, Joseph? <laughs> That's right. He said, Acts, the continuation of Christ. And, um, you know, if you're in the front row, <laughs> you may get called on. So uh, just a little warning there. You're in the firing line at any point, especially if you were in my room, Shen. So, um, uh, anyway, it's been so wonderful to see the book of Acts. And I don't know what you think about the book of Acts or what your impression of Acts was before this weekend or before we got into it recently. Uh, why is it called Acts? Anybody know why is it called Acts? It's a strange name for a book. Actions. Actions. Okay, that was good. Shin said actions. Yeah, that's right. Acts, Acts is short for what? Activities, right? The actions, the activities, the movements. And do you know the full name of the book? The Acts of the Apostles. So when you read the book of Acts the first time, um, you know the way the Bible is divided up. It's divided, the New Testament is divided with history and then epistles and then prophecy. So you read the book of Acts and you think, okay, so this is a book of just telling us about Peter and John, and they just went here and they did this and they met these people and they did this and then there's this guy called Saul, and he became Paul, and it's, this is what the book of Acts is about. It's just a list of activities. But what do we see? We saw this weekend, actually, that's just on the surface. That is just to, just to understand the Bible as just like a, another textbook, right? Just a book of history. But actually, we need to realize what? That there is an intrinsic significance. What does intrinsic mean? Intrinsic means that there is something, something essential, something beneath the surface, which other people, they may not see this, but this week, hopefully the Lord has shown us something. And so I would like to propose a new title for the book of Acts. Okay. I would say it is the Acts of God in man. You see, you know, and what we see it as the Acts of the Apostles, but actually what you see in the book of Acts is God is acting. God is acting. But it's not just activities. So if you look at the book of Acts and you consider, we, we just want to continue, right? Many Christians realize that the book of Acts seems to have no ending and we want to continue. But actually, it's, it's more than just being in activities. Actually, we see there is a wonderful person. You know what the book of Acts is about? It's about a wonderful person. Who is this person, Eric? The Lord Jesus. Oh, there is a wonderful person. And this person is revealed in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Oh, you know, did you know that the book of Acts was written by Luke? Luke wrote the gospel, and it's the gospel of the forgiveness of sins. And when you read in the gospel of Luke about this person, Jesus Christ, oh, his humanity, he's so full of compassion and forgiveness and love. And he sees a sick person, and he doesn't just walk to the other, other side, but he heals them. When somebody dies, he comes and has compassion on them. This is the Jesus we see in the Gospels. And then you come to the end of Luke. I don't know if I, I have never noticed this before, before I studied Acts this time. But the end of Luke, it ends with uh, the account of the Lord Jesus. You know, it says that he appeared after the resurrection. He appeared to the disciples. If you read, read the Gospels, you may notice that he appeared to two very disappointed people. They're walking down the road. I think, do we sing this song? I don't know. If, Remember we sang this song the other day. They're walking away. It says they're walking from Jerusalem down to Jericho. And he just came and he met with them. And he appeared to them. And he showed, oh, he caused their heart to burn. And then eventually, it says that this Jesus, he, he lived, he died, he resurrected, he ascended. Well, this one, it says, he said, you will be my witnesses. Actually, it says that, not in exactly those words, but it says it in the book of Luke. 
But then you come to the book of Acts and it repeats. It says for a period of 40 days, the Lord was doing this. He was with the disciples. He's appearing and he was disappearing. And then he gives them this commission. He says, okay, Janias. Sorry, sorry, Gabriel, thank you. Where's Janias? Janias back there. Oh, this is going to happen. Like, Gabriel says, stay here. Okay, stay here for how long? Did he say, did he say how long to stay there? See, I'm testing how much you read the book of Acts. <laughs> he says, stay here until I pour out the spirit. Wait here. It he actually doesn't say how long they should wait. So what are you going to do? <laughs> uh, the Lord told us to wait. What should we do? Uh, Peter, I don't know what we should wait. Well, you know, they waited, but they prayed. They said, brothers, we need to go and pray. So they gathered 100, there were 120. So how many are we here? 100, 190, something like this. 120 of them, it says, with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his, and his brothers. So maybe 190, maybe, so, so maybe this is about the same number. I don't know what kind of size room it was. Have you ever thought about that? It says they went to the upper room, but you know, it'd have to be pretty big to fit all these people in. And what does it say they did? It says that they prayed. They continued steadfastly in the prayer. You remember the atmosphere. This Jesus, whom they had been with, who they had witnessed, now he is gone. And they're, they're waiting for, the, for him to pour out the spirit. And so they, they just... They just, they just prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed. And we know that they prayed for 10 days because it was on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost means the 50th day. So we know it's 10 days because he said he appeared to them for 40 days. So they must have been together for 10 days praying. And then the Spirit was poured out upon them. Okay, so then what happened with this group of people? Oh, they had been through all of this with the Lord Jesus. They'd seen him, his living, his person. And now they've seen him. Now they've been praying. They've been brought into one accord. Now the spirit was poured out. Now they were, it says, when the spirit was poured out, it was like the rushing of great wind, right? And it said there was like tongues of fire upon them. I don't know if you, what, what that looks like, but there was fire there. Because they prayed themselves in one accord into a condition where they were just filled with the Spirit. Now, a question, were they already, did they already have the Spirit? Yes, we know that from John chapter 20. They already had received the Spirit within them because he said, receive the Holy Spirit. So this group of people, they mean praying. They already received the life of God. But they were praying. They know Oh, Jesus, he told us we need to do something. We need to be his witnesses, right? They couldn't just go and witness. They had to pray. They had to be in one accord. Then what happened? The spirit was poured out, not inwardly for life, but outwardly upon them, like fire and like tongues. What does a tongue signify? If you see a tongue, what does it signify? It signifies speaking. So the, the spirit, they were just so filled with the spirit, they just spoke. In so many different languages. What do they speak? Gibberish? Nonsense? No, they spoke the wonderful works of God. They were filled with the Spirit so that they could speak the Word of God. Where? Just in Jerusalem? They would have just spoken in what? Hebrew. But it's amazing. The first sign was everyone spoke in tongues. And it was like, you go back and look at all the different locations mentioned there. Oh, in so many places. Cilicia and Pergamon and oh no, you know, all these different places you can't pronounce and the, in antiquity. It was because God wanted this Christ to be spread everywhere. You know, today many people talk about tongues in the wrong way. They think, well, have, do you speak in tongues? Do you speak in tongues? Well, you've not got the spirit. That's not the point. The point is he wants us to be witnesses throughout the whole inhabited earth. So the spirit is just poured out. Then you have a group of people who are filled inwardly with life. They have upon them the spirit as their authority. Now they can go. 
And immediately, Peter stands with the 11. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. Perfect. Stand up, brothers. Brothers, okay, look at everyone there. Look at everyone out there. And he says, this Jesus who you crucified. Whoa. Who was saying that? Was that Peter? Am I Peter? Can you see Peter? No, you see, you see, you see 12. You see 12. You can sit down. Peter was no longer an individual. He was in the body and he was in the spirit. This is what God had accomplished on the earth. When you read Acts, you don't just see individuals just doing some kind of common work, mission work. No, you see the continuation of Christ. You see Christ multiply. What? In a group of young people who had no idea what they were doing. No idea. They didn't know what they were doing. So what do you do when you don't know what to do? You pray. When you know what to do, you do not pray. When, when the resurrected and ascended Christ appears to you and says, you will be my witnesses, and the condition around is like you're risking your life, what do you do? You pray desperately. Oh, Jesus, we love you, but we have no idea what to do. We don't know how to do this commission, but we're here. Here we are, Lord. We've left everything, and here we are. We're standing here for you. Oh, can you imagine the kind of prayer, the atmosphere, this kind of prayer? You know, I'm not just here by myself. I'm here with Paul. I'm here with Kyle. I'm here with Michael. We come from many different places, but we've all seen Christ. We've all seen Jesus, and this is our testimony. We are nothing. We can do nothing, but we've received a commission. It's not us that qualifies us. It's the spirit, it's, and it's the commission of Christ. We have all been commissioned. Do you see this? What a book Acts is. It's not just a book of some people inspired and going to tell some things. No, this is Christ continued. And so when they speak, there's Peter. What? Peter? Who is this Peter? I just, that Peter was the one who just said, you know, these same 11, they stood up, well, 10 of them, stood up before. He said, even if all these guys, if they leave, I will never. Now he's standing with them. I'm just one of them. I'm no better. Well, who was Peter? This is the Peter who failed, who denied the Lord. You know, he denied the Lord. He denied the Lord. The Lord said, if you deny me, just a few verses before, if you deny me, I will deny you. The Lord, the Lord told Peter that. And then Peter denied the Lord, not once, twice, three times he denied the Lord. And then what does he have? The boldness to say? He said, you denied the Lord. He says that. Read it. Why? How can he have that boldness? Because he was filled with the spirit and he was in the body as part of the corporate me, the continuation of Christ. So what is the book of Acts? It's a book concerning this Christ being propagated. Who is this Christ? This Christ is, oh, this Christ is now in you and in me. He's resurrected. He's ascended. And you know what else? He is the spirit. So many times you see in the book of Acts, you know, the book of Acts, this message today is going to be on prayer, the spirit, the word in the homes. The book of Acts has more mentions of the spirit than any other book in the New Testament. More mentions of prayer than any other book in the New Testament. And in this book, you see the spirit said, the spirit led them. And you also see, it says the Lord said, you can say, is it the Lord or is it the spirit? Yes. The answer is yes, because the Lord is the spirit. How can this group of young people, right? I don't know if the, if the disciples were any older than these brothers here. Do you think these brothers know how to carry out God's commission on earth? They have no idea, brothers. That means you're in the perfect place. Because what does that make us? It makes us. So this is significance. We need to see this. Don't disqualify ourselves by saying, oh, my condition. Are you any, are you any worse than Peter? No, we're all the same. I'm not blaming Peter. I'm the same as him. I'm just saying we're all the same. And we're all qualified because we have been redeemed by Christ. 
and we have been filled with the spirit and we have been qualified as members of his body. So this is this is a continuation. And I just want to tell you uh, something which you may have forgotten. And that is God loves you. Do you know that? Eric, God loves you. You know that, Eliza? God loves you. And so, you know, when we come to these conferences, so many times I just think about my failures. Lord, I don't feel qualified. All the other brothers and sisters are wonderful. But me, I don't think I can make it. I don't, I, you know, maybe in the past, two years ago, but now, Lord, all these things have happened in, in the way. And I just, I just don't think I can do it. I don't think I'm the right one. I think you made a mistake. But actually, you need to know this. God loves you. And what, what does that mean? Out of his love, he chose you. He chose you. You need to realize this. God chose you. So when Kyle was sharing about the heavenly vision, remember? He said, I don't know if you picked this up. But he says, this man has been chosen. He has a chosen vessel. Okay, if you're going to choose somebody, if you're going to choose somebody to tell out all the virtues of Christ, if you're going to choose somebody to bring people out of darkness and into light, what kind of person would you choose? Oh, you would choose the best one, right? God chose Saul. Okay, I, this chapter, chapter 9 of the book of Acts starts with this. It says, and I don't think there's another utterance in the whole Bible that starts this way. It says, but Saul still breathing, breathing, you know, inhaling and exhaling, threatening and murder against the disciples of God. Okay, that's the kind of person. What kind of person is that? Okay, the other day I was with a young man and he, he's just so burdened for young people in gangs and all kinds of things like that. And he told me a story about one of the young people he was looking after and he said oh he got into he got into drugs and he got into um dealing and he said he came to him and he said he said oh this guy he um he basically he did something which which upset his pride and he said i'm gonna i'm gonna get the guys i've already got the guys together i know people we're gonna we're gonna go and you know take care of him and my my, my brother who was, I was shepherding he he said, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. What do you say? And he said, he said, he already has his plan. He already knows what he's going to do. He's going to go there. Some people, and you know, when their people are angry, they're just, you just, the anger there, that was Paul. He was, this is Jehovah, the holy God. Don't call him Jesus. You call him Jesus, you're going to jail. You know. And he said he grabbed them, dragged them from the prison. Oh, this is the one chosen. Oh, that, who heard that? Ananias heard that. Him? I don't, you know, Ananias is pretty bold. You know, sometimes you read, read the Bible and you see how it says, like, the Lord said this, and then they reply something like, I don't know, Lord. He's like, wow, if God appeared to me like that, I wouldn't reply. I'd say, okay. But he went, are you sure? Him? This man is a chosen vessel. God loved Paul. And Paul says eventually, I was chosen to be an example. What? Of God's mercy. Brothers and sisters, forget about your history. God loves you. He has chosen you. And the blood cleanses us from every sin. What is our qualification to be here? It's not us. It's not even our seeing. It's his mercy. We're here. Why were those 120 there? Because they were the ones who were strong enough to make that decision? No, it was God's mercy. Eventually, it is mercy all immense and free. For oh my God, it found out me. So please don't disqualify yourself. I can't do it. I can't be it. It's not about us. It's about him. His purpose, his choosing, 
And Philippians says, he who began in you a good work will complete it. He will do it. So this is, this is half an hour. Wow. Um, Nathaniel, where are you? I'm really hoping for a, for a nice whiteboard here, but it's not here. So I'll just have to draw it into your imagination. Um, okay. We may not get that much into the outline, but we'll try it. We'll try our best. Okay, so but then last night we shared about this matter of consecration of, of the upper room. And I'd like to, I like, oh, look at that. Ye of little faith. Okay, so, oh, just in time, right? Just in time. Okay, so, okay. Now, many of us may not be familiar with the Old Testament. Right, and that's okay. I love the Bible, though. I love the Old Testament, and uh, especially recently, I've been getting into those who those who are around me. They know um, I really enjoy going to the British Museum. Right, me and me and Ben, we went last week. Was it last week? Yeah. Oh man, we had the greatest time. And the thing about the history, you know, we have in this country. I just have to say, one of the most amazing like treasures. Because we've got all of these historical things in the British Museum, which which point out things in the Bible. Anyway, um, I could give anyway. You you all know I could talk all about that. But my point is, when you come to the Old Testament, for those of you who are not familiar with it, there was always in God's heart a desire to have a kingdom on the earth, a kingdom. Okay, that is His desire. God wants a kingdom. And who is the king in this kingdom? The king in this kingdom is God. God is the king. And who are all of the dumb? Us. He's the king and we're the? Oh, maybe not so easy for you to say dumb, but we're the dumb. Amen. I'm happy to tell you I am part of the dumb. That only works in English, but... Um, there is a kingdom, and God is the king, and we're his people. Actually, even in Revelation, he says he made us a kingdom. This is always his desire. And so to have a kingdom, you need to have a people. And, um, oh, this is, this is the right kind of pen? I don't know. Maybe he's coming back. I'm not sure. We'll find out. Uh, oh, that's the right kind of pen? Okay, okay, great. great. Okay, so, so did you notice, we actually haven't mentioned this once in the, in, in, I don't think in our sharing, but when the Lord speaks, do you remember what he says? He says he appeared and he disappeared, teaching them about the kingdom of God, right? The kingdom of God. And so a lot of the book of Acts is talking about the kingdom. So we know this. Let's just start with the basics. God wants a kingdom. For a kingdom, you need people, right? Um. But in the Old Testament, we see there was a period of time. I, I'm, I'm a bit nervous to use this pen, but take your word for it. Um, okay, there was a period of time where the children of Israel, they come out of Egypt and they had come into the good land and they were, they were there in the place that God had chosen them to be. And then it says that Everybody was doing what was right in their own eyes. And actually, the situation was terrible on the earth. Everyone was just doing, this is the book of Judges, okay? The book of Judges is like this. And then they say, they say, you know, all these other nations, all these other nations around us, they have a kingdom. We want a kingdom. So when they said, we want a kingdom, they didn't mean they want God as their king. They wanted their own king. Okay, stand here, brother. Come here. Okay, and this is, this is the man they found. He was taller than everybody else, and it says he was very handsome. So I got the right brother. And um, they found this king. They found this man. His name was Saul. Uh, not the Saul in the New Testament, so don't get confused. Another Saul. And they made him the king. Thank you. That was good. And, and so what happened was, um, this really disappointed God. And Samuel, he was the priest, he was the prophet, he was the person who turned the age. 
He said, God said to Samuel, Samuel, don't be disappointed. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. They're rejecting me. Why? Because what they want to do is they want to, he, and he told them, if you, if you take him as the king, he's going to take your daughters and your sons. He's going to take all your food. He's going to take everything, and he's going to take everything for himself. Okay, so this was Saul, and that's actually what happened. So Saul had his kingdom. They had this kingdom of uh, Saul. Oh, wow, wonderful. Okay. Yes, there you go. So you have Saul, and you have him, and you have his kingdom like this. Okay, but interestingly enough, so everyone is within the kingdom of Saul, which is actually the kingdom of Israel. Okay, this is actually an amazing picture because you see Saul is the king, but then within the kingdom, do you know what God did? He chose, come up here, Shin. <laughs> he chose a shepherd boy, a boy who was with among the shepherds, and his name was David. Okay, this is David. And he, he chose him to be the king. This is in the book of Samuel. But he chose him when? David was chosen while, all the time, Saul was the king. So this is a complicated situation. You've got like, one is going to be the king, and one is the king. Okay, thank you. So what would you do if you're David? Like, you try and overthrow. I am chosen by God. I'll overthrow, overthrow Saul. But actually, what happened is David, it says David was a man after God's heart. And Saul... He, he, would not, he would not take the throne for himself. He would wait for God's timing. So you are all beginning, some of you are beginning to wonder, what does this have to do with the book of Acts? There will be, there will be, just wait and see. David was here, but you know what happened was, David, he was, he beat Goliath, right? You know the story? Some of you have heard this in Sunday school. And then the people start saying, oh, Saul, he's amazing. But David, oh, the tens of thousands, he just, he killed everything. That made Saul jealous, very jealous. So Saul wanted to do what? He, I think he might have been, from my reading of the Bible, he might have been schizophrenic. Because you read the account, he's like, one minute, he's like, David. And next one, like, he's throwing javelin at him, trying to kill him. Then he's like, David. And then it's like, it's like back and forth all the time you're reading. It, it, honestly, you read it. I, I, I'm, I'm being, I think he had a problem. But David, David was like, he had to run for his life. But David, he couldn't do it by himself. In order to bring in the king of David, he needed some people. And when you read 1 Chronicles chapter 12, you get to the, this is after Saul dies. It gives us an account. And this is what I want to point out here. Oh, time. Slow down, please. Okay. In Chronicles chapter 12, which is 1 Chronicles chapter 12, after Saul's end, it gives us the account. And this is an amazing account. It says, now, this is verse 1, it says, Now these are those who came to David at Ziklag, while he was hidden away because of Saul, the son of Kish. And they were among the mighty men who helped him in battle. So it starts listing all of these people at Ziklag. That's right at the beginning. And it starts listing all of these people who were with, who were with David. Even though Saul was the king, some, they decided, I'm going to join. Where's, where's David? Come over here. David. I'm going to join David. Come over here, Aubrey. Aubrey sees something. He sees Saul's the king, but God's heart and God's mood is with David. I'm going to be with David. I'm going to be with David. And he says, these were the, these were the, these were the mighty, he says, these were the mighty men. And it goes through, you read through, you read through. <clears throat> and then you get to this verse 18. It says, then the spirit came upon Amasai, the head of the 30, because there was 30 of these men. And it says, we are yours, O David, and we are with you, O son of Jesse. Peace, peace be with you, and peace be with those who help you. For God, for your God helps you. And he made them head of the troops. And then verse 22, it says, Indeed, day by day, they came to David to help him until there was a great army, like the army of God. You better come over here, brother. Do you want to come and be with David? Are you with David? 
Oh, you had to come to this. You had to sometimes you had to go to the cave. You couldn't do it outwardly. You had to hide away. David, you read, it's amazing. I mean, the Bible has the best stories. Sometimes they're hiding in caves. Sometimes they had to go to the valley. Sometimes they had, they were everywhere they went. They were, we're for you, David. Who's the king? See, it's complicated. Outwardly, it is so. But in God's eyes, David's the king. They are living, you could say, in a sense, in the kingdom of David, even though David's kingdom hasn't come yet. Okay, thank you, Rose. You can sit down. Now you get to this verse here. Okay, verse 32. It says this. And of the children of Issachar, men who understood the time. This is a very particular phrase in the Bible. It says, men who understood the times. Do you understand the time? What time is it? Okay, this is the time. I'll show you the time. I, I'll show you a clock. I don't have. Oh. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. This is the time. The Bible, if you, if you have a recovery version, and I would highly, highly promote the recovery version with the footnotes. It has amazing notes and charts. But if you get, to, if you get into Matthew chapter 5, it has this amazing, thank you, both, has this chart of all the dispensations. And I'm just going to imagine, if you imagine the whiteboard is all, I'm trying not to get feedback here, brother, sorry. Um, if you imagine this chart has got like circles, one, two, three, four, five circles. Over here, you have this circle over here. A big circle. That is eternity past. Okay. Then over here, a big circle. It's eternity future. Okay. So you see these two? Don't worry about the other circles. Just one over there. What is it? Eternity past. What's over there? Eternity future. How do you get from eternity past to eternity future? You need time. So God had to create this thing called time. And through this time, there's lots of different circles. But eventually you get to this one circle. It's called the age, every age. This is called the age of the church. The age of the church or the age of mystery. The age of the church. So God has decided that his way of traveling through time, the human history will be in different ages. So this age will come to an end. Every age comes to an end. And there will be another age. Actually, the another age is even clearly revealed in the Bible how long it's going to be. It says a thousand years, a thousand years of the kingdom of the heaven. This here is the age of the kingdom. Okay, this age, the, when this age ends, this age begins. When this age finishes, there's a new age coming. This age is the age of when Christ comes back. The Lord Jesus, he is resurrected. He has ascended. Even in Luke or, or, or Acts, I forget, it says he, he ascended from the Mount of Olivet. And it says, the, the angels, they say to him, the Lord will appear, re, come back in the same place. So the Lord, he, he, he began this age by leaving, but he's going to come back here. Okay, do you see the picture here? What age, what time is it? Do you know the time? The time, we're very close to the end of this age, and there's another age coming. So those men, they understood this age of Saul is about to end, and there's another age coming. It's the age of David. It's the age of the kingdom. Do you see today? It seems like Satan is on the throne. Read the news. Somebody blows himself up at a hospital. There's just poverty. There's problems with the climate. There's problems with race. There's problems with inequality. There's problems with the oceans. There's problems with plastic. There's no good news. There's rioting. There's protesting. There's fighting. More than ever before. You say, oh, technology will solve this problem. We can send a man to Mars. Well, let's just go, you know, this is Elon Musk's brilliant idea. We'll just colonize another planet. Is that going to help the problem? No, you're just, you're just running away from your problems. That's what you're really doing. The problem is this humanity. The problem is humanity. 
Who will solve this problem? Jesus. When Jesus comes back, no more climate crisis. When Jesus comes back, no more race problems. When Jesus comes back, financial problems are thrown into the lake of fire. You don't need money. Forget about it. This COVID, this COVID situation, the rich became super rich. People are on food stamps. People are just, what? The poor get so poor. The rich, there's no quality. There's no equality. You want to solve the problems? You want to give yourself something? Give yourself to the Lord Jesus, his kingdom being established on the earth. And listen, it's not waiting for tomorrow. It's today. Do you see that? Do you see this? They were with David today. Do you want to be listed in that number? Oh, I was with him at Quinta Hall. I didn't wait till the end. You want to wait till the end? When all, the, all of these things in Revelation are coming? No, now, today is the day to give ourselves to the Lord. This is the book of Acts. It's a group of people who are living in the kingdom of God in reality today, and they are propagating this Christ. This is what we see in this book. We need to know the time. And we need to give ourselves, not because we're anything, but because we have seen something of his vision on earth today. So we will get to the outline. So, um, and you may be wondering, yeah, page 15, is it? No. What page is it? 19. Thank you. Page 19. So we have prayer, the spirit, and the word, and the home, sorry, the word and the homes in the book of Acts. So how is it that God spreads his kingdom on earth? I have so many things. <clears throat> Okay, let's all read Roman numeral one together. <clears throat> the book of Acts shows a God's ordained way to carry out God's move to fulfill his New Testament economy is entirely by three main substances, prayer, the spirit, and the word. Okay, so I want you to circle. I'm trying my best to make this simple because I know, especially for those of you who are new, your first time, it's a lot of words. There's a lot of things, a lot of concepts. Circle the word way, okay? There is a way, okay? There's a way, and this is the way. Actually, it's mentioned five times in the book of Acts. It says they were of the way, the way. They persecuted the ones who were of, that's even who Saul used to persecute, the ones who were of the way. So do you know the first time, I just discovered this this morning in my enjoyable Bible study, the first time the way, this may be, anyway, this is from my personal study. The first time you see the way, phrase the way in the Bible is in Genesis. It says, he closed the way to the tree of life. That's the first time I've seen in the Bible. There is a way to the tree of life, and it was closed off. There's a way. And you read through the Old Testament again and again. The way of Jehovah, the way of the Lord. It says, Moses knew my ways. God has a way. There's a way. And it says again and again, it says the way of peace, the way of righteousness, but it's called the way of life. And there's at least two times in the Bible, you see this choice put before us. In the end of Deuteronomy, it says this Moses says, I have set before you. Life and death. Therefore, choose life. And then you read in Jeremiah. I don't think I ever read this verse before. This is Jeremiah. You can write this down. Jeremiah 21, 8 says, Thus says Jehovah, I am setting before you the way of life and the way of death. So in God's eyes, there's only two ways. You say, well, I can take my way. I can take his way. I can take her way. No, in God's eyes, there's only two ways, the way of life and the way of death. Um, okay, let me try this. Um, so I was just considering this. Um, when, we, when we look at how this Christ can be propagated, how we can have, have this kingdom of God on the earth, what is the way that God chooses what is the way, god's unique way he says you, you have to take his way 
actually in our life, I'd say there's, <clears throat> this becomes very vivid to us. Can I get something to wipe the, uh, the wet off now off the board? Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let me just do it like this without a board. <laughs> okay, so if you have, okay, thank you, thank you. That's good. I'm okay, Nathaniel. Just trying to run against time. Those who knew the time, what kind of time it is. Okay, right. Okay, so you have a way. And many times I think we think about like a way, like a this way, but I was thinking about it like this today. Uh, there's a, okay, just imagine there's a line here. Okay, this is the way. God has his way and, but there's another way. But it's like that way actually is just like this. It's like, the, you know, if you, some of you can drive and all of you maybe eventually will drive. Um, but it's like there's off ramps on this way. This is God's way. Actually, we all begin on this. And like what happened in Genesis is like he closed that way. But God opened the way in the New Testament by Christ coming. But there's lots of off ramps. Have you ever gone off the wrong ramp, Aubrey? Yeah, I've done that many times. There's lots of off ramps on this way. And it's like God has his way. He wants to bring in the kingdom. And, and then we suddenly get the idea, oh, I know how to do that. <laughs> we, need a, we need to have hmm, a rock concert. <laughs> a rock concert work. That or without a work. And we take our way. Right? Or um, we need to hire the best speaker to come. We need to get that brother Peter Kroger. He's a good speaker. <laughs> Me and Peter, no, just put Peter on the board. I'm not going to say that one that bit. A speaker, some, some professional. I say professional. <laughs> a professional to come. Uh, you know what we need? We need money. Our problem is we don't have enough funds. Let's get more. If we had more funds, we'd have better materials. So we need money. <laughs> There's lots of different ways off this one way. Okay. But let's see. What is the way that God takes? Don't come off the way. And in you, what you can see through the Bible is God has this way. But every now and then people do what? They swerve. They go off the way. They go down to Egypt. They go down to this play. They go down to that place. But God has his way. How do you know what God's way is? Do you know what God's way is? Well, that's why we need these three substances. How do you know God's way? God's way is prayer, the spirit, and the word. That's it. There's no other way. There's no other way. Don't add anything. Prayer, the spirit, and the word. Okay. I wish I had two hours, but you may not wish I had two hours. Okay. <laughs> If I had two hours, I'd wish I had three hours. So, okay, so well, let's read point A. We must pray that we might have the Spirit as the power to spread the word. Okay, brothers one and then sisters two. We must get ourselves saturated, constituted, and even soaked with the holy word. If we are burdened to preach the gospel, we must get into the word and be persons who know the word. Sisters too. Okay, so in these three points, A, one and two, you can see prayer, right? So I said before, circle the word way. Here, circle the word pray in A. And then the word in one and the spirit in two. So we need to pray to have the power to spread the word. So we need to be, we need to be filled with the word and with the spirit. Now, I'm not going to spend much time on the, on the word, but it's, it's very simple, actually. We need the word so we know what to say to somebody. Have you ever had that feeling like, Oh, I really want to say something to my friend, but I don't know what to say. 
Don't know what I'm saying, right? You have the feeling, that's the spirit, but no words. Why? Because we haven't been in the word. Uh, when you have the word, you're in the word, you're with them, and it just flows out. You don't even, you, you don't even try to, it just comes out. So if we want to spread the gospel, we have to be in the word. And then we need to be full of the spirit. What's interesting here, you know, a lot of people, especially the Pentecostals, they are dear brothers and sisters, love the spirit and the emphasis is on the spirit, but they may not realize, and especially the spirit, the aspect of the spirit of power, they may not realize the key to receiving the spirit of power. Do you know what the secret is? It's not to fast and pray all night, as many do. That is not the key. Okay? The key is to repent. The key is to confess our sins. When we confess our sins, we go to the Lord and under his light and are dealt with by him, we get filled with the Spirit. You know, when we think we're something and we, we're so capable, uh, actually, we don't get much blessing. But when we realize, actually, Lord, I am a sinner and I am a failure. And Lord, I need you. And I just repent and I just turn to you. Filled with the Spirit. <laughs> it's kind of not what you expect. You go to the Lord. You admit. You genuinely confess where you are. The Lord fills us with the Spirit. Okay, let's have uh, brothers on B, sisters on C. The early disciples could not have maintained the one accord if they had different ways, means, agents, or substances for them to carry out the Lord's move on this earth. We must not think of taking away other than prayer, the spirit, and the word. Any other way will cause dissension and division. See, sisters, we should live by Christ, live out Christ, pray and help people to receive the living word of God so that they might be reborn. This is the way to bring forth the proper fruit. Okay, so... In B, circle one accord. And in C, circle live by Christ. This is the way. The way is the one accord, and the way is abiding in the vine. If, this is God's way. God's way is prayer, the spirit, and the word. So now the next points, two and three, are concerning the prayer that we need. Okay, so point two, let's all read together point two. The book of Acts shows that the apostles never initiated any work without prayer. Whenever they wanted to do something, they stopped themselves by their prayer, giving God a way to come into them, to fill them up, and to saturate their entire being. Hey, sisters, in order to be one with the Lord in his work, we need to pray ourselves into God and pray God into us so that we are mingled with God. Brothers, to pray means to stop ourselves from doing anything apart from the Lord so that he can do his work through us. Altogether, see, to pray means that we realize that we are nothing and can do nothing. To pray is to deny ourselves and to declare, no longer I but Christ. All right, so there's two aspects of prayer here. Okay, in this aspect of prayer, okay, so I just want you to put, write down the word beside Roman numeral two, fellowship, the prayer of fellowship, okay? This is what we need. We need to learn how to pray. Okay, now I want, as your further reading after the conference, I would like you to get hold of this book, which is available uh, online or from a bookshop, a good Christian bookshop near you called The Meaning and Purpose of prayer. Okay, this book may change your life. Okay, <laughs> it's by Brother Witness Lee and it is amazing. Okay, so I'm going to read some of this to you. So when we talk about prayer, first of all, what is prayer? Okay, you can, okay, you can write this, you can write this down. It's two things. Prayer is to absorb God and prayer is to express God. That is what prayer is. What is prayer? To absorb God. Tell your neighbor, 
absorb God. <laughs> oh, brothers and sisters, to pray is to absorb God. My wife has very cold hands. Okay? She always says, feel my hands. They're freezing. I'm like, yep, they're freezing. They're really cold. If you stand next to like a, like a cold wall, oh, you lose all your body heat, you know? But if you get close to the fire, you start to warm up. You start to absorb heat. We need to absorb God. Just like some clothes are under an iron. How long does it take for an iron to heat up? Two minutes? It's not hot to start off with, right? Sometimes you're with the Lord. Oh, don't touch anything. I don't feel anything. There's no heat. Give it some time. Let it warm up. Let it warm up a bit. And then you, put, you apply the iron to the clothes. And the clothes, you like to have warm clothes. Sometimes I, I hang, my, hang my, clothes, my coat over the radiator. And so it's a cold dance. But my, oh, it's so nice. It's just feel nice and warm. When we're with God, it's just like a piece of clothing that's been warmed up. It's been infused with God's element. We have to learn this is the meaning of prayer. So when we're reading about the Acts, we're saying, oh, Acts, oh, they go here, they go there, they do this, they do that. Oh, that's what I need to do. I need my chemist. No, forget about that. First of all, we need to stop and absorb God. Then you say, well, I don't know. That sounds great. I like that. But how do I do it? Well, we need to learn how to pray. To pray, and that's why I recommend this book, and we don't have time to get into it. To pray is to just express whatever you feel in here. Are you angry? But if you were angry, he doesn't look angry. That's why I say he's angry. But if you were angry, go to God and express that feeling to him. Are you disappointed? Are you afraid? Are you frustrated? Go to Jesus. Spend time with him. Open up your heart. In Samuel, it says that she, uh, Hannah, said was pouring out her heart to God. Eli was so clueless concerning what real prayer was. He thought she was drunk. She's drunk. You're just drunk. What kind of foolish woman are you? He said, no, I'm pouring out my heart to God. I don't have a child. And he said, Lord, I've been here in university. I've been a Christian all these years, but I can't make it. I don't know how to be a student. The brothers are talking about being the corporate Christ, but I don't even know how to pray. That's genuine. God will answer that prayer. To pray is to be genuine. You know what genuine means? The same on the inside and the outside. You tell God, I don't know how to pray. Then you have your first real prayer. Brother, he says in here, some people have been praying for 10 years. They don't know how to pray. I, I'm really enjoying getting into um, oh, time. I'm, not, I'm really enjoying getting to the Bible. And I discovered there's these monks. Man, these monks are dedicated. Whew. They've been in this monastery in Alexandria, right since like 300 AD. And they've been doing this thing every day. They go into the monastery. They pray for seven hours. I don't think they had a single prayer. Because what is prayer? Prayer is to absorb God. And to absorb God, we need to spend time with him. So we're frustrated about this. We're this, whatever we are. We just tell the Lord, Lord, this is my situation, but Lord, here I am. I just come to you. I open to you. Saints, this whole conference means nothing to us if we have not learned how to touch God. And you, if you want that, you have to ask for it. The Lord told us himself. He said, you don't have because you don't ask. You say, oh, I don't have a degree because I didn't ask. Oh, I don't have my money because, no. He wants to give you God. I mean, what, Michael, what better thing in the universe can he give you than himself? Some people, they want health. They're frustrated. My health, my back, this. If only I had this. If only I had a wife. If only I had this. If I, they want all these things. Nothing will satisfy you. Nothing. 
but God wants to be everything to you. He wants to be your light. He wants to be your life. He wants to be your husband. He wants to be your children. He wants to be everything to you. Your hope, your dreams. He wants to be everything, but only if we learn how to pray. And that's why I like to recommend going to the full time training. <laughs> but if the Lord, that's not in your path, that's fine. Forget about that. That should never, never be an excuse to you. God, I need to learn how to absorb you. Then what happens when you absorb God? He begins to give you words to express. Prayer is first of all receiving and then expressing. If David put it this way. He said, one thing have I desired of the Lord, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire. I love this phrase. This is what prayer is. Firstly, prayer is beholding, beholding, beholding. And then prayer is what? Inquiring. Did you, have you ever inquired? Have you ever inquired in your prayer? Don't just tell God what to do. Have you ever asked God, what do you want to do? How do you feel? Lord, how do you feel about my degree? How do you feel about this relationship I'm in? How do you feel? Just ask the Lord. It's not you're just telling him, asking him. Behold and, in, uh, and inquire. Okay, so this is the first kind of prayer in two. And in three, we have the book of Acts shows us the prayer that we need in order to be filled with the spirit essentially and economically so that all our activities would be the activities of the acting God. The first kind of prayer is the first point. If you don't get the first point about learning how to, if we don't learn how to absorb God, forget about all the activities, okay? The activities come out of a person who has been mingled with God in his mind, emotion, and will, and is saturated with God, okay? Then, now you're ready to work. Before that, we're not qualified to work, but we, we need to see this. God wants to move. He wants to move in Munich. He wants to move in Birmingham. He wants to move in Glasgow. He wants to move in your life, in your family, in your neighborhood. He wants to move. His heart is so desperate. In 1 Timothy, it says he desires all men to be saved. All of them. Every single one. He knows every person on this planet. Every struggle they're going through. He knows their frustrations, their disappointments. He knows them. And he wants them to be saved. But here's the thing. He can't. He's limited. Do you know that? God is limited. He cannot move in this country. He cannot move in our lives unless somebody prays. That's, that's just a principle. In this age, God only moves by prayer. I'll read you a verse I find very touching. It's from Isaiah 59, 16. And he said, and it's, you can write that down and maybe pray over it sometime. Isaiah 59, 16. And he says, and he saw there was no man. He said, and he saw there was no man. Who's he? He is God. He's looking. And he saw there was no man. I'm looking for a man. I'm looking for a man in your university. Look, at, is there a man in Durham? Is there a man? I'm looking. He said he was appalled that there was no intercessor. That means there was no one praying. Nobody was praying. Maybe many people were praying different things, but no one was praying for what was on his heart. He's looking. God cannot move unless we pray. It's like he's, you know, you imagine there's a train, right? Full of power, full of energy, but no tracks. It's so powerful. You know, it's right here in Quinta, and it'll take you all the way home. But there's no tracks. There's no tracks to Kingston. There's no tracks to Glasgow. We have to drop you off at the station. It's so powerful, but it can't get from there to the... God's will is like God's heart's desire is just like this immense power in the universe that has no way to flow out because nobody has laid the tracks. The tracks are laid by our prayer. Oh, God wanted to move. God wanted to move. He wanted to go to Turkey. He wanted to go to Italy. He wanted to go, but they're stuck in Jerusalem. 
So God had to have a new start. And they, you know what he did? He had a new start in Syria, of all places. Syria, all these today, filled with Islam. In that city of Antioch, there was a group of five of them, five brothers. You know what they were doing? They were absorbing God. They were absorbing God, enjoying God. And then they had a way for God to send them out. He said, okay, Saul, Barnabas, you go. And the Spirit sent them. Why? Because they were, they were praying. They were laying the tracks for God to move. So first we need to pray to absorb God, express God in our fellowship. Now we have prayer for the work. What does this prayer do? Okay, this prayer is the prayer in A, that brought in the outpouring of the Spirit. In B, it's the prayer that shook the earth. In C, we see prayerlessness is a sin, and we must stand against uh, prayerlessness. But point D says that this prayer is spiritual warfare. Are you ready for a war? Are you ready for war? God needs some people who can fight. He needs a group of people in Liverpool who are going to fight for God's move. But, brothers, we have to admit, we need to learn. We need to be, Joseph's the right person, right? We need training. You can't just send anybody, right? You have to be trained. I mean, into the army. You have to be trained. So what do we need to do? We just need to pray first personally, and then we need to get with some others to pray. Okay. Point, let's go on to point four together. As an additional help in the preaching of the gospel, we need the homes. Okay, A, all together. Without the basics of prayer, the spirit, and the word, our gospel preaching will be ineffective. However, we still need another practical help to make our gospel preaching work as effective as possible, the homes. Sisters one and two records that the apostles preached the gospel from house to house. At the end of Acts, Paul preached the gospel in a rented dwelling, a house, not a chapel or cathedral. Brothers B, one and two, pray and see if there are any homes near your campus that are available. In the homes, the students will be inspired by what they see. They will see the real social life, communal life, and family life. The homes will touch, soften, and warm up their hearts to receive the living, piercing word. So, brothers and sisters, after these very spiritual, deep, and profound matters of prayer, the spirit, and the word, we have something so practical as a, as a, as a base. And we see that this gospel work, this practice of the church life in the New Testament was not carried out in the, in the synagogues or the temple. It was carried out in their homes. Let me ask you a question. Do you have a home? I hope so. <laughs> if you don't have a home, come and talk to me. Okay, so we all have homes. Our homes are the place where everybody feels comfortable, at rest, you know? But maybe your home is not that comfortable. <laughs> maybe I wouldn't feel that much at rest at your home, I don't know. I'm talking about in your student accommodation. I'm not talking about your home home, I'm sure it's great. But student accommodation sometimes doesn't feel that homey. But you know what? In the, in the New Testament, it says they pray, they preach the gospel, but it was in the homes that they continued day by day. And so I'd just like to tell you, we need the homes. The homes are the best place to, to bring your friends. So if you are in Kingston, you can come and see me and, and uh, Kyle and Esther or Donna or Karen. Just bring your friends over. But first of all, what should you do? Pray. Be filled with the Spirit. Be in the Word. And then bring your friend. Bring your friend to our home. And that's the best place for them to receive the Lord. The best praise for somebody to receive the gospel. And some of you, you actually have a really nice home. Peter was telling me in Munich, man, I want to go to Munich. The brother's house there sounds amazing. <laughs> and I'm sure that was a good place to bring people, right? Oh, yeah. As Aubrey, we're going to go over to your home. Yeah, come on over, he says. Anyway, we could talk a lot about that. But it's in the homes that people get saved. Anyway, so let me just finish with this. So as some practical points, 
Saints, we don't have to go leave this conference and go downhill. We want to leave this conference in Acts 1, 14. And they continued steadfastly. And Acts actually finishes with Paul with his own rented dwelling, preaching the gospel unhindered. That's how we want to continue. So I give you some, some practical points to finish with. One, so write this down. Pray that the Lord and decide that pray and decide to give the Lord a regular time to pray every day. Now you know how long that is according to your capacity. Number one, we need to learn to touch God. Okay, not to do something, but to pray to touch God. Number two, pray for some companions with whom. You can pray for God's move on your campus. That's number two. Number three, schedule, hear that word? Schedule a time to read the word. Okay. If it's not given a time, I don't think it's going to happen. You know, I just don't think. We can leave this conference and say, oh, yeah, I remember prayer, spirit, and the word. Okay. But when? If you're serious, you need to give the Lord a time. Okay, and the last point is pray for a home where you are to be joined to or to, and to bring others to. Okay, so you get these four points. Amen. Sorry, my apologies for going over so much. I'll, I'll give, uh, not sure what we'll do, because I'm sure there's many of you who want to share. So hopefully there's still a way to do that.